All right, you can hear me. Good. <laughs> so. Yeah, I can hear you well. All right. So this is something we can Sorry, discuss. I, was just <laughs> I just went back from another meeting, so... Okay. All right. So is there anything else? That, uh, I'm sorry I couldn't get you coffee and donuts this morning, but uh, <laughs> here for all the other committee members, I guess. Is there anything uh, that we should discuss before we get started? I would just offer that uh, Dr. Cowell uh, mute herself by uh, pushing the little uh, microphone icon while she's not speaking. So, um... Sorry, yeah, I remember you told me this last time. I just forgot. So let me see. Uh, can you see me now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. Um, ben, ben, if yeah? you want to see Dr. Cowell, you can, uh, Gus can come in and show you. Oh, I think you've got it. Yeah, bring up the participant list and then go to thumbnails. Um, bottom right, you'll see a little icon, a list icon. Yeah. And you can see her uh, there as well. Can we make her larger? And then, Dr. Cow, I'll probably mute you so you can unmute yourself when you need to speak. You just uh, click on the little microphone icon to mute and unmute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, for now, I'm not going to have this because. Yeah, you don't need to see her. All right. All right. So, uh, thank you all for coming this morning to my defense. And if you have any questions at any time, feel feel free to stop and interrupt me. Uh, raise your hand, and we'll answer that as quickly as possible. What I'm going to be presenting today is my uh, past five years' work with Dr. Yamalov on the establishing uh, criterion for random media and also looking at correlated disorder. So this presentation will be in two parts. And uh, let's also thank our computational sponsors and financial sponsors before we get started. All right. So to motivate and kind of set the, uh, the, the, the scale at which we're operating, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the past 50 years where microelectronic structures have gotten smaller and smaller. This has kind of uh, driven our technological development. And that's going to be a bit of an issue in the future because we're now approaching the scale at which the electron has to be uh, taken as a wave and no longer can be treated as a classical particle uh, when looking at microelectronic circuits. And similarly, for photonic systems, we can now manufacture devices that, that are at the scale which have features about the size of the wavelength of light. And so for both these devices, we're, we're expecting there to be unusual behavior that you wouldn't see in the bulk systems because you were at a, a transition in the mesoscopic scale between the classical and quantum behavior. So this is kind of the scale that we're operating at. Uh, and so since we're no longer treating things in the bulk, we can no longer use the diffusion approximation because that uh, assumes kind of a random walk. And so we're going to be interested in the effects of wave interference. As I mentioned, there's two parts to my talk. The first will cover random media. This is the first few years of my uh, work. And what we uh, have done is we've taken a numerical model uh, using the transfer matrix method, and we've used it to enumerate a new parameter space, uh, which includes uh, different tra uh, transport regimes for non-conservative media. So this is the, the first part. And then we moved into what are called deterministic aperiodic systems. And I'll explain a little bit more about that when we get there. But the idea was we applied what's called the type binding model to this 2D through Morse pattern, which is a specific instance of the deterministic systems. And then we used that to measure different transport properties. And uh, we saw some, some neat things there. Uh, and as a reminder, the diffusion approximation applies to random media. But in this case, since we're, uh, and to review why that would break down with the uh, inner wave interference, you'll occasionally have in your random walk these loops which occur. And you can go in either direction around this loop. And if you're not keeping track of the phase, then the intensity just adds, uh, as you would expect, kind of twice the intensity if you're going in either direction around this loop. But if you are keeping track of the phase, it's no longer the same, because the constructive interference of this loop when you keep track of the phase 
uh, doubles what you would have for an incoherent system. So the intensity is increased, which is going to cause your diffusion coefficient to decrease. So these loops are what cause a, a breakdown in the diffusion approximation. One of the first people to recognize this and actually uh, develop an explanation for what's going on was Philip Anderson, who won a, prize, won a Nobel Prize for his 1958 paper. And the essential idea was that you have uh, a diffusive system where the states are extended due to, this, uh, due to the random disorder. But if you increase the amount of disorder sufficiently and you account for wave interference effects, then these states become exponentially localized in space. And that's the upper picture here. And so that is very different from a, a diffusion assumption. And that's just due to the disorder and wave interference. But you'll notice in this picture here, I didn't tell you whether you were looking at an electronic system or a photonic system. In either case, uh, the, the description is valid due to the uh, wave interference. And there's some advantages to studying uh, a photonic system over the original electronic systems. Namely, you don't have to operate near zero to see these effects, so you can actually do your photonic experiments at room temperature. And photons don't have any charge, so they don't have to worry about charge interference effects between the different electrons. But with, when you're working with photons, this also introduces a bit of a challenge because your phase space, instead of just being passive where all the electrons uh, don't disappear, with photons they can if you have absorption or they can be, the number of photons can be increased due to gain. So to review, uh, for passive systems, there's three distinct transport regimes due to disorder. The first is called ballistic where you have a few scatterers and there's a little interaction there. If you increase the amount of disorder in the system, or you make your waveguide longer, in my case, then you can get into what's called the diffusive regime. And this occurs when your characteristic transport lengths, the transport mean free path, if the waveguide is longer than that, or if your waveguide is shorter than the localization length, then you're in what's called the diffusive regime. If you extend your waveguide to be even longer and introduce more disorder, then you enter what's called the localized regime. And this is where we start seeing the, uh, the corrections due to wave interference effects. But as I mentioned, what we're interested in is not the passive system, but when we have both absorption and gain. And here, uh, instead of just two transitions with these characteristic lengths, we enter a whole new set of uh, boundaries between uh, extending just these two into the new parameter space. And the consequence of that is the main takeaway message is with all these different boundaries, we get, instead of three, 15 different transport regimes. So the, the added dimension in the phase space makes the transport description much more complex. The challenge now with our, our prediction here that there's going to be different transport behavior is to, to develop some way of characterizing uh, which transport regime an experiment is in. So if I'm doing an experiment, I want to know what kind of transport behavior should I be expecting. And so it'd be nice to have some quantity to tell us where our experiment is in that parameter space. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Just, just counting up those little regions in there, I, I don't get 15. Right. <laughs> my long line boundaries or something? Right. So if, if you notice, this, extent, this line here uh, between the ballistic and diffusive systems extends upward, as does this one. And when those meet, they intersect. Okay. And there's some additional boundaries. For example, if we have so much absorption that uh, the system is no longer diffusive, it's actually ballistic. So even if you're over here, say, and you add so much absorption that the system uh, doesn't even have time to have multiple interferences, then it's sort of ballistic. And so there's additional regimes both abo above and below this, this, uh, this plot here. But this is just the region of most interest because we have new regions of Anderson localization. So the ballistic regime goes out into the plane? Uh, out exactly, the, yeah, right. right. Oh, okay. So the, yeah, there are additional regimes not shown here. So the main idea is that we previously had in passive systems three distinct transport regimes, and now we've got a whole new set uh, due to accounting for non-conservative media. One of the instances of why this would be interesting, for instance, is that you know there are loop corrections which are causing Anderson localization. So what happens to those loops when you introduce gain? Right, that system uh, may form a lasing cavity, and this would be uh, something that would only be apparent when you add gain to the system. And Anderson localization, and very importantly, is defined for infinite passive media. And so we're going to be working with finite systems, and they're going to have some sort of absorption or gain if we're working with a photonic media. 
And so we need to define what is Anderson localization in finite non-conservative media. Uh, so I pointed out the need, when you develop this parameter space, some way of characterizing where your experiment is. So we need a criterion, but more importantly, before we even get there, we need some way of studying random systems. And it's very difficult to develop a, a, uh, an analytical theory that can handle non-conservative media. And so we are next going to start out with uh, our numerical model, which is going to allow us to make this investigation. What we're using for our numerical model is the transfer matrix method. And this is simply the idea that if you have a disordered system in you know, a waveguide, you can translate the electric field from one place to the next by multiplying these matrices, which tell you about the, the electric field. And so there's two different types of matrices here, if you can see that. Uh, one is representing scatters, and the other is representing the space between scatters. And we're just, it's, it's distinct from the finite difference time domain. But, uh, the idea is just to trans transmit our electric field to the waveguide. When we do that, then we can find, uh, for instance, a single disordered waveguide. That's what this will tell us about. And for, for example here, I'm showing the intensity uh, inside the waveguide in yellow to red, and then the flux in blue. And I can, any quantity that you tell me about, any well-defined mathematical quantity for transport, I can find using this numerical model. It might take a little bit of work on my side, but I can do that with this. And then... How do you, how do, would you calculate something like the transport mean free path? Right. So. There, the transport mean free path needs a good definition, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so normally, where the transport mean free path comes from is the diffusion approximation. And so if this, uh, if the output, if, if we can measure the diffusion... It's uh, not so defined it's, outside of an approximation, you're saying? Right. It arises when you make the diffusion approximation. That's where the transport mean free path comes from. So, uh, but in our model, we can see how well our results correspond to, say, a classical diffusion system. And then we could measure the transport mean free path. But more accurately, the transport mean free path is also used in other uh, analytical models that make predictions about what we should see for various transport properties. And, but they use the transport mean free path as a fitting parameter. And so from by matching our model, our model results to these other analytical predictions, we can see what the transport mean free path is as their fitting parameter. But in our case, we're not using the transport. But it doesn't have an intrinsic meaning? In the I mean, I look on your phase diagram, and I point to a certain point, and I say, is there a well-defined transport mean free path at this point in your phase diagram? Is that an answerable question, or is that? Uh, so for a, yeah, so there's two answers. One is, if you're making uh, a particle-based assumption, then you can use the diff diffusion approximation, and then the transport mean free path is well-defined. But for systems where you include wave interference effects, then you have to look to other analytical models that use the transfer entry path as a fitting parameter. Is that what you... I think you have it later in the, uh, in the in your talk when you define the flux, the relationship between the flux and the energy density. And that yeah, so defined. it does show up elsewhere, but it's, never, it's not... The conceptual idea is that you have... Uh, it's wherever the path is sufficiently uh, randomized, that the direction is normalized, or randomized. But that doesn't tell us how to calculate it microscopically. I, I, that's a, that part of my point is that you know it's it's a concept that seems to apply to a particle which is moving through the system. Right. And you get this field, right? And then right. now you're making a statement. I can compute anything from my field. That and is so all I, the I just wondered about this particular particle property, whether you could whether that's right. something that's accessible in, from your calculation. Right. It's important because almost every numerical model or every analytical model uses the transparent free path. It's very universal. Right. Right. But it needs to be well defined before I can calculate it. And this is part of the challenges. We can use it from other models where they're using it as a fitting parameter, but we can't calculate it microscopically because it doesn't have a good wave based definition. Right. So everything that you can define in terms of expectation values that you can calculate, right? Not, what do you mean by that? Well if if I give if I give you a, a an operator for a quantity then, then of course you can calculate any of those within this in the transform because they're method, right? because they're microscopically well yeah. defined. Yeah. Right. So there's no operator that corresponds to something whose expectation value you calculate that would be the transport mean free path. Right. So this is a bit of a, a challenge because everyone uses it though. So you have to sort of make sure that everyone's working from the same idea. 
with their knees on it. <laughs> and the complication comes from the transport in the, in, in transport mean free pass because in other mean free passes maybe maybe easier to define or yeah. Well, yeah. So for instance, the, there's the transport mean free path, which is how long it takes for your direction to be renormalized of a particle. Right. There's also the mean free path, which is the distance between scattering events. That's right. of course yes, well yeah. defined. Yes. So and the scattering like length this, yeah. and a few yes. other definitions. <laughs> so keeping track of all these is important though. Alright, so if there are no more questions, uh, this is what, so we were just talking about a well-defined quantity for a single realization, but more importantly, for uh, random systems, we're almost always interested in statistical quantities because we're interested in, say, uh, developing a large ensemble that we could find, say, the average for some value of 4. And for that, we use our supercomputers, and we can calculate, say, 10 million different instances of the disorder configuration, and from this, we, we have an ensemble or we can measure statistical quantities. One, the reason I bring this up is because what we're going to be looking at in, uh, for this system is called the position-dependent diffusion coefficient. And this is motivated by our previous work in one-dimensional systems where we came up with the criterion of the transmission to energy stored in the system as a ratio. And we showed this was uh, perhaps useful in systems with, absor with gain. And so this motivated our looking at the position-dependent diffusion coefficient. So that's what we'll be looking at next. Uh, th that uh, is defined for passive systems as uh, a relation between the flux uh, through the system, which is constant, and the gradient of the, energy, uh, the intensity. And so we can define it analytically, and we can find it numerically from an, our model for a passive system. And the intensity, of course, just decreases. Now, z is a particular coordinate. Uh, z, in, in this case, is the length of the wave guide. The length of the wave. Yeah, so it's the direction of propagation. It's not the length, it's the transverse coordinate. The so that's, yeah, that's what uh, in the direction of propagation. The coordinate along the axis of the wave. Oh, along the axis, okay. Yeah. So, so this is your, you're sending a, a flux of electromagnetic waves into on the left, right, and, and hoping that they'll get out on the right some way. Correct. And yeah. in steady state, you solve this in steady state. Exactly. And then you, you find uh, energy conservation in passive media, I guess, makes the flux the same everywhere. Exactly. But but the the energy per unit length, I guess, is what W is that? Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, not actually defined in your thesis, by the way, but um, that that decreases linearly across the for system. a passive system of disorder. Yeah. In the diffuse region. In the diffuse region. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, wait, wait a second. So, uh, how is it the flux can stay the same and the intensity? It, are you talking about that it, it's diverging out this way? I, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I don't. I don't really understand that. Okay. Flux to me is photons per centimeter squared per Passing second. Passing some, some, right, And so if you, you multiply by an energy, you get an intensity. Uh, so you must have a different definition of this. So the the flux is the amount of energy passing through a given region. So. Per unit time, per right. unit area. And so if you uh, then look at the, so for a given position, that the flux has to be the same uh, compared to somewhere else in the system. So you have, you're not losing any energy in the system. Right. Because it's steady state, because it's passive. But the intensity is decreasing because there's reflection out of that system. So the flux is the Z component of the flux. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So the 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 flux uh, when we say it's not changing, it's because we have boundary conditions that are it's a metal waveguide, and so it doesn't escape out of the system in this direction. Does it get absorbed? No. This for this is for a passive system. I mean, not not in the medium, but at the boundaries. No, it's uh, reflected back. No, I'm still not getting that. I, again, to me, flux and and intensity are just proportional to each other. Oh. So. Sorry, I, I dropped the, the subscript here, Z, which, so we're looking at the flux in the, Z, in the transverse direction. So there's a direction of propagation, mm -hmm. which is uh, sorry, I'm confusing not this, but we're looking at the flux in the... No, 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 it's the lateral direction. The Z, I remember, is zero. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, the Z, Z axis here is the, the direction of propagation along the waveguide. Okay. And this is the, the flux in that direction along the Z. Okay. But so is the intensity. It looks like that's a W of Z. Right. The intensity decreases. There's a Z component. Is W a vector? No, scalar. Is J a vector? Yes. 
Okay. So that's 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 what's going on. Is is you're you're scattering off axis yes. then. Yeah. So right. the so, so it's increasingly bouncing off of the, the two things, right? In a narrow wave guide. Yeah, in a narrow wave guide you have reflection from both boundaries and the scatter can uh, the, the wave can the so intensity isn't the uniform point. across the transverse direction. Okay. Across the transverse direction. Yeah, th this is the Z component of the flux, where the flux actually has two directions to go, right? But we're comparing it to the scalar quantity of the intensity, in average across the entire waveguide. So, okay, I'll have to think about that. <laughs> so once we have those two numerical quantities, we can take them and, and find what D is for a given waveguide. So for a short waveguide, so in a diffusive regime. Uh, this is a wave. This is the numerical results here in red in the dots for a uh, short waveguide of 100 wavelengths long, where the transport entry path is about 17 wavelengths. So it, it's longer. It's not the ballistic, but it's still diffu somewhat diffusive. But you'll see it's not flat. We, for a classical system, you'd expect the diffusion coefficient to be constant throughout the system. But here we see it's not. And the reason behind that is. There's wave interference effects, and these loops, which I talked about earlier, are uh, increasing the intensity right, and decreasing the amount of the diffusion in that region. But these loops, which form in the path, can only form far from the open boundaries. So we have a waveguide, and these loops are forming more intensely, more likely in the center of the waveguide, which is why we have a position dependence of the diffusion coefficient. So it renormalizes in the center, but not near the boundaries. So these aren't. This isn't. There isn't an effect due to the fact that loops can't form at the edges of the at the, at the metal. Well, the, that they can't form near the edges of the metallic boundary right. anywhere in the waveguide. Exactly. Right. Right. So there's so no that position. That will reduce thing. it uniformly, I guess, is what you're saying. Right. right. So you're not seeing that effect, but only near the edges. And, and the, what happens when the boundary conditions here? What are the boundary conditions at the when you say the open boundaries? What does that mean? So we're, we're we have a, a metallic waveguide filled with uh, point scatters, and then we're sending we're sending in say, a plane wave into that system, and we're seeing how it, uh, how the energy is distributed throughout the, the, the wave. Yeah, and, and some of that, that, that wave reflects, and it continues to reflect as it goes in, and so there's an amount eventually that's coming back out of the original direction that's determined by all the reflections. And right, so we have both transmission and reflection out of that wave. Right, right. and then at the, uh, the other end, once, once it's gone through, then you just have an outgoing, right-going, I guess, wave. Right, it just passes into free space, basically. Uh, right. Or you can think of it as a, a waveguide, which is, doesn't have any scatters if the, if, if the index is matched. There's well, like I said, this, is a, this was a question I had while I was reading the thesis, is you use this transfer matrix method, and you have the, the, the matrices that, that evolve you just past a scatter, right? Because mm -hmm. it integrates the, the delta function right. and imposes discontinuity of the derivative as opposed to continuity. And, and continuity of the, of the of the wave. And then you have the free propagation up along the z-axis until you have the next z-coordinate where you've got a, another you know, scatterer. Scatter. And so you do this, and and when you evolve past the next scatterer, you you get both right and left going waves. Uh, so that that's one basis to work in. That's not the basis we're working on. I, I understand, but but, yeah. but you do. If you transform back to that basis, you get both left and right going waves. Exactly. And so now I get to my last scatterer. Yeah. And now I get both left and right going waves once I've evolved past that. Right. Well. What's this right going wave? Or what's the left going wave that I have at the after I've gotten past my last scatter? If right. I just have a simple, that's your simple empty wave, wave guide. Right, that's your output. That no, you no, can no. Measure. What's the left going wave? The right going wave, yeah, that's, that's my output. output. That's oh, the so one that's going. The left, left, the going, left wave. going wave that I get when I evolve past my last scatter. Right, so that's just going to reflect back towards your input side. No, no, but it's on the right of that scatter. Yeah, so here's the, here's the waveguide. Oh, I'm going, going, going along, this is my last scatter. I get past it. And now over on this side, according to what I understand your numerical solution, you have a left and a right going wave. Yeah, yeah, I see. After the last scatter, there's still something going to the right. Exactly. Yes. And it's like you're sending light in from both sides in a certain sense. The solutions mm -hmm. that you're getting, are they not in some sense as though you're sending you know, less perhaps from the right because that... That guy is, is there. But uh, Is there really that? <laughs> Does that that's yes. the way I understand. It's non-zero? Uh, so the amount of flux that we're sending in from the right side is zero. We're not supplying any source there. 
But yeah, so right. think about this as, 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 an, as an perfectly reflecting binary condition at infinity or something like this that is responsible for this. No, but of yeah. course, technically, it comes from your basis transformation, right? It, I, I can see that, but, but what's the physics behind it? So, uh, so the question is, what happens to the energy that goes in, out to infinity, right? So that, that, that may be the answer to that question. Yeah, I don't know. I was confused thinking about your method. I, you know, I thought it was very, very clever, but I got worried about what happens at the end and, and what do I mean by... The, the T, by the way, is the fraction of input energy that ends up going off to the right. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, that's, that's simply... You normalize it back to one. It's, it's a dimensionalist quantity. That, that, yeah. Uh, okay. So actually, the, the, when you do this basis transformation, surprisingly, you get back the... So I think of it in terms of like A going to the, to the right... Uh, yeah to the right and B going to the left. Okay. And we make a numerical check in our code that says, is the value of the flux coming in from this direction zero? And it is. So to answer your question, we're not supplying any uh, input on that side, and the flux that we detect is zero. Okay, but you're, you're probably in this from the left, right? I mean, yes. you're, you're in the market, it's transfer matrices, so you're going on. And, and, and so you're saying, that somehow, ma it sounds to me like you're saying, somehow magically, when I get to my last scatterer, that, you know, five scatterers back, I didn't know what it was going to be. But now I get to the last one, and somehow that left going wave has zero amplitude, which is what I want, of course, but uh, I don't know how that could be arranged to be so. Mm. Perhaps I can adjust the location of my last scatterer or sort of something to make <laughs> that happen, but in general, it, it doesn't seem to me that that would be the case. And so uh, I was just a little concerned about that, and maybe we can oh. resolve it later, perhaps. Yeah, I see where that's coming from, but uh, I know so what I'm tracing back to, not the physics, unfortunately, but the actual numerical code, and what I'm saying is we check that the actual, uh, how much flux there is going in this direction on the output surface is zero. So we do that check, and then that's I seem to have some sort of inherent I know. conflict between those two stations. <laughs> exactly. Okay, okay. So the physics of why that is, uh, I see where you're coming from, but unfortunately that's not the basis I work in, so I haven't thought of it in that way. Okay, I got to bring up one, one other one about the uh, the idea that you can't form loops near the the boundary. Yeah. I, I I understand at the ends, but with with your your metal wave guide, mm -hmm. uh, why can't they bounce off? You're just folding back on yourself. Why can't you have a loop that involves a reflection off that? Yeah, that could. So having does a, your model include that? Right. Yeah. So we don't work in the actual basis of what's going on in the loop. We're working in terms of these channels of the waveguide, but yeah, that would physically that would occur. Yeah. yeah. And so it's one way to think of this is instead of having perfectly reflecting boundary conditions, is to just have, uh, if you have the slab, then your loops, which would form, they uh, should still exist when you cut that into a metallic waveguide. Mm -hmm. All right. So the idea here was that we have these loops, and they're renormalizing the diffusion coefficient. And we can make our waveguide longer, introduce more disorder, and not surprisingly, perhaps, the intensity is increased because of the loops and more strongly uh, correcting the diffusion coefficient. So we see more position dependence there. The transition from, say, the diffusive regime to the localized regime here, in this case, is 400 wavelengths for the specific geometry. And uh, we're, we're seeing very good agreement between the, the prediction from self-consistent theory, which are the solid lines in our numerical calculations. But this is just for a passive system. And remember, we're interested in non-conservative media. So next we'll add. Just, again, just to yep. make sure I'm trying to stay with this. But um, James Z really is, the, the, the Z component of the flux is constant throughout your system. So even though, you, or is that not true in this case as well? I mean, the energy conservation doesn't mandate that the Z component of the flux is constant throughout the system, independent of whether it's diffusion approximation or not? Or? Right, the energy conservation is independent of diffusion, diffusion approximation. Yeah. So, so the, the flux, the, the constancy of the flux across the system, that's true no matter whether you have Anderson localization Correct. or not? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so really what we're seeing here is just a variation of, it, it's just the fact that this is not a straight line. W of Z is not a straight line. Exactly. What we're seeing here. If, it, if, if W of Z were actually a straight line, then you would get, of course, a constant value exactly. when you take the differential of that. Right. But here, this is the effect of it not being straight. Okay. So we'll kind of see that uh, later on. But So now what we want to do is introduce some way of including absorption or gain into our system. And we can do that by taking the energy conservation equation, applying that to our original diffusion uh, equation. And we get back a, an, a relation that tells us how to think of the position of a diffusion criterion when we have uh, absorption or gain in the system. 
and I can also look at that numerically. That's pretty straightforward to add in. And the intensity inside, and so the flux is now changing, and the intensity is decreasing when I add absorption to the system. So this purple lines are indicating increasing amounts of absorption. And as I said before, we just take numerical derivative of this, and we can find uh, what the position of the diffusion criterion looks like when we have absorption in the system. So again, this is the red dots uh, are the numerical results for passive media, and the solid line is for self-consistent theory. When we add in more absorption, then what we see is this is going back towards the flat uh, diffusion. And the reason for that is, is because the diff absorption is removing the effect of the loops. Right? It's killing these loops off. And so you're, again, changing what the diffusion coefficient is. But that change is a little bit different than we saw in the passive system. You can think of, uh, for both the passive system and the system with absorption, uh, fitting these curves with a polynomial. And this will be a bit useful because we can use this as a way of uh, determining which transport regime we're in. Right, so we could fit this with a second order polynomial and look at different aspects of that fit. So this is kind of our, our main conclusion for the random system is that we made a prediction for uh, this transport space and then we've found a way, and this is since the uh, zeroth order coefficient from that polynomial fit as a function of the amount of disorder in the system, so the length of the waveguide, on the uh, horizontal axis, and then on the vertical axis, we see increasing amounts of absorption. The, the color plot is the uh, value of that coefficient, and then the black lines and the purple line are overlaid from our theoretical prediction with no fitting parameters. And so we see those same transport regime changes showing up in our numerical simulation results, which says we have a very good agreement uh, with our prediction. I, I didn't follow much of that, I have to say. Sorry. All right. So if, if you did if C two is zero, you're fitting what this is this is the D of Z fit as a function of Z. So if C two is zero, it's it's strictly diffusion, right? It's, there's no Anderson localization. Do I understand that? Because it's flat, right? In that case, uh, Z is flat. Right. Well, yeah, C zero would be one in that case. Well, this is an actual polynomial that we're using. It's a second order polynomial, but we actually have to shift. If you recall, for the the coordinate system, we have to shift over the z-axis and right. you know, set c0 to be 1 when it's diffusive. But oh, OK. Yeah. So the idea is, if this is flatter, it either indicates it's very diffusive, or it indicates that you're increasing amongst the absorption. It's shifted and mobilized, and then you fit. You, you right. right. And then you fit. OK. Right. okay. But, but and then, of course, if c2 is 0, then you're, you're either, in, in the absence of, of uh, absorption, then that's strictly diffusive in that case. Right. But you're saying absorption can also give you it, it can reduce C2. Right. right. That's what you're saying here, because this becomes flatter as, right. as you increase the, the absorption. And, uh, but, but do you say, therefore, it's not localized? If, if it's initially start off with something which, which is strongly Anderson localized or something, you have strongly uh, Z-dependent diffusion coefficient, and now I add absorption, then as this goes up, what do you say about the system? Is, is it localized? Is it not? I mean, what is your criteria right. for localization? So the question is, if, like, for example, if, if you define conductance as equal to 1 as the transition from diffusion to localization, and then for passive systems, but then you add in absorption, that conductance will also decrease. Is that still called diffusion, yeah, yeah. right? And so the answer that we've come up with is that really you can't stick with the passive definition of Anderson localization. And the actual, we, so we've enumerated that there are three different types of uh, media that could be considered to exhibit Anderson localization effects but they're not the exact same as a passive Anderson localization effect. So these are what we're, we're saying could be called pseudo Anderson localization. And then if you add sufficient amount of absorption, it'll actually kill off all the loop effects right, and go back to diffusion. But this is, again, distinct from what type of uh, behavior you would see in a passive diffusive system. So the question is, do you call it Anderson localization? And we're saying it has the effects of Anderson localization, say these loop corrections, but it's not the same as a passive Anderson localization. So is it simply that if, the, if your absorption length becomes much smaller than what would be the localization length, then, then it doesn't make any sense anymore to speak about localization in the, in the, in the, in the old sense? Right. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like there's yeah. a, you know, it's like if you go to this loop, and the point is that the, the self-propagator, if you will, is enhanced as a result of the time-reverse path. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, uh, 
it's decaying. It's being absorbed along that path. And so the amplitude of the, right. the interference effect is just going to decrease as you increase the, uh, the absorption, uh, yeah, decrease right. the absorption length. And there's the other idea is that there's a competition between how long it takes to get around the cells yes. and how long it takes to get absorbed. Exactly. So right. there's a, a competition there. I notice you're plotting this as a, the vertical axis is this LTMFP over LA. Yeah, transforming through path in terms of the absorption length. Right, and, and so again, the question, how do you get that, in order to be able to plot that, you, how, where does that come from? Then? So we're, we're using, so like on, when we compared passive systems, the diffusion coefficient, uh, right here, uh, so the transport mean free path, we can calculate, and can, when we compare our numerical simulations to uh, the position of the diffusion criterion, then we can Say for this given the geometry, simulations to the to the self consistent self consistent theory, theory yeah. right, right. And so when you make that comparison, we're not using any fitting uh, parameters, and so we can actually see what it is that they find for the transform for path and what we're uh, claiming it is. Or, or sorry. Once once we make this comparison, then they have a transform for path, and that's what we can uh, compare for our system. So they we have from the theory a, a way of analytically extracting. It's not a parameter they put in, right? Obviously. It's a, so, so I'm not sure exactly the self-consistent theory has scatterers in it of exactly the same sort of thing, or no? They're working with ladder diagrams, and so, so, so they're it's working with an energy basis. They're not like they're not working in terms of waveguides. They're not working in terms of uh, channel-based description. They're working with uh, these ladder diagrams, which I'm not as familiar with. So the, the, the transport mean free path is not a parameter that goes into the theory. It's something that comes out. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. I'm also having a hard time understanding what it means to, to, with no parameters, you're fitting this theory, which has waveguides and so forth, to something else which doesn't have waveguides and so forth. So are, you know, the parameters are the same in these two descriptions that you can fit it without any, no fitting parameters, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. So. It, Not as, I'm not familiar with how the comparison was made, but yeah. Okay. So, once we get back to this uh, idea that we can fit these uh, with a polynomial, then we can make a comparison for the uh, with the coefficient from the polynomial, but we can also look at different aspects of this fit. And so, for example, we can look at the variance of the uh, curve, and we can look at the value in the center of the waveguide, and all of these are giving us different transitions between diff different transport regimes. The variance between the different realizations. Um, is the this is the variance of the, the curve of the polynomial. So, so, how much? Like, you can look at the average value of a polynomial, right? Sorry, I'm not funny. So, D of Z is, is, is a quantity that exists only after you've averaged over lots of things. Correct. Right. Yes. And now you've got a curve, and you're going to fit your your fitting function to your your D of Z, right. renormalized, et cetera, as Thomas was talking about. Uh, and so, but but you, so what the what is the variance that you're talking about? Is how well it fits? Is that the question of? Uh, it's the so if you take the so for instance the first if you look at the curve, there's some average value, right? And for the curve, yeah. yeah. In that region of the waveguide. Oh, it's just a reparameterization of the uh, uh, Exactly. Right, right, right. Right. So this, we're, all of these parameters are coming out after we've made this fit of the D of Z curve. But the idea is there are different aspects of the polynomial fit that we can use to characterize these different transitions. So, uh, and which of these would be most appropriate to characterize which regime transition is not clear yet. So this is one of the things we're working on currently is to figure out what we should be using from this uh, fit to characterize the transition. So to review for random systems, the uh, localization in a photonic system uh, kind of inherently has non-conservative media, and so we're going to have we're going to have to account for these different transport regimes, and maybe even come up with a good definition for random localization, as we pointed out. And to study this, we used a numerical model, uh, which uses the transfer matrix method. And using this, we measured the position of a diffusion coefficient as a possible criterion for the transition from diffusion to localization. And then what we want to do next is establish which parts of this uh, parameterization uh, distinguish the different transport regimes. And then 
as you may have picked out, we only looked at absorption systems, right, and so uh, with some of the localization, and so we're going to want to ex extend this into the full parameter stage space, which includes gain. So this is uh, kind of an overview of our upcoming work. All right, so now we've seen a lot of interesting behavior for random systems with uh, wave interference, but that's all based on something that's not as easily reproducible. So we want reproducibility, and it probably has to come out of something not being periodic. So we have to come up with possibly an algorithm to develop these systems which have an interesting behavior, but they're not random and they're not periodic. So this is uh, part two of the talk, which is discussing uh, deterministic aperiodic systems. And you can kind of pick out that there's already going to be interesting behavior just by looking at the Fourier transform of these systems. So for a periodic system, a periodic uh, sequence of scatters, the Fourier transform is just uh, some delta functions. If you have a random system, which is what we've been looking at previously. What is the Fourier transform of? The, the Fourier transform of and you're coming from this random sequence. It's just the no, no. I mean the first one. Say what is the what, what is okay. the quantity that what function of x and z is this that that's the Fourier transform of? So this is the periodicity. If you have a pattern of say uh, two spaces and a scatter and another two spaces and a scatter, so that sequence, so to say for a, a thousand digits, the Fourier transform of that. This is what the illustration is supposed to be. Of. It's three It's a discrete sequence. Right. Let's say zero one zero one zero one. Yeah. So I zero zero one zero zero one zero zero one. E to the I K one times E to the I K zero plus E to the I K one plus E to the I K two. Right. Yeah. Times weighted by. Okay. Got it. So so and then we can repeat this instead of say for a periodic sequence of, of binary digits, you can have a random distribution and take the Fourier transform of that. And you can see there's very distinct behavior, obviously, but more interestingly, for a deterministic systems. So I'm showing a specific instance of this aperiodic media called the Thue-Morse pattern, and it has sort of a fractal structure in this Fourier spectrum. And so you can maybe guess that there's going to be interesting behavior, but it's not clear just from looking at the Fourier spectrum what you would actually expect for the transport behavior. So that's what we want to investigate. And in order to do that, we're going to have to look at some different tools. Uh, again, diffusion might not necessarily apply because we're not looking at random systems, and we want to account for wave interference. So the first task will be to pick out which of these deterministic aperiodic systems do we actually want to work with. And there's lots of different patterns. For instance, the Fibonacci sequence, or there was I've shown before, is the Thue Morris. There's others called the Rune Shapiro. And there's all these different aperiodic generation schemes, and they kind of fall into a two-dimensional parameter space where you can characterize them by looking at the Fourier transform and the spectrum of energy. And they can either be uh, singular continuous, or sorry, singular, like the Fibonacci sequence, or the Fourier transform could be singular continuous, or uh, absolutely continuous. And the Thue Morris is kind of our, our favorite because it exhibits singular continuous uh, spectrum in both the energy and in the Fourier transform of the uh, spatial lattice. So that's what we'll be choosing for today's investigation. So singular, singular continuous means there's both. Uh, delta function-like spikes, as the system scales, they become more uh, point-like, but there's also features in the Fourier spectrum which are fractal in nature, so they actually show up and they're, they're scale-dependent. And so the, the size of the system depends on what kind of spikes you'll see uh, for the Thue Morris pattern. So periodic is singular? Periodic is singular, yeah. Pure. pure just, like a, right. just like the Fibonacci sequence. So, uh, so the actual idea behind the Thue Morris pattern is very simple. It's just a substitution algorithm where if you have the letter A, then you can replace that with AB in the next generation. And as you incre increment this generation, you're making this a substitution of B to A, sorry, A to B, A to AB, and B to BA. And you repeat this, uh, repeat for, say, a, a sequence of strings, A and B. And since we're interested in optical systems, we actually want to map this into scatters. We'll replace the A's with scatters and B's with vacancies. So now we have a one-dimensional system where we can uh, pretty easily apply the type binding model because for each site, there's, say, a, a, a nearest neighbor and a next nearest neighbor, which are clearly defined. So this is, uh, they've been pretty well studied in the literature historically for one-dimensional systems, but two dimensions is not uh, as well studied. One thing before we move on I want to draw your attention to is for this entire mapping sequence, if you make an infinitely long Thue-Morse pattern, 
you'll never say you'll never see three scatters in a row, and you'll never see three vacancies in a row. This is kind of hard to wrap your head around because it's not periodic and it's not random. Right? It's predictable, but you'll never see um, say three scatters. Is that the only integer for which that's true? Well, you won't see three or larger. You'll see either two or one scatter, right. but never three or more in a row. Oh, okay, so the scatters are, in a sense, well separated in some sense. There, yeah, yeah. dimers and monomers in a certain sense. Yeah, right. got it. So th this is a feature that which we'll take advantage of uh, later on. But so now what we want to do is take this algorithm uh, and translate it into two dimensions or higher. So we'll take our initial finite two Morse pattern, and then in the second dimension. We'll use each of these values as a seed for the next, uh, so in this instance, a column. And then wherever we have a vacancy, we'll use what's called the complement, the opposite uh, arrangement of scatters. And in this way, we repeat this uh, for each seed value in the original dimension. And then we've built up a two-dimensional through Morse pattern algorithmically. So this is a, a very straightforward way. And again, you can see that there are clusters of only size two by two, and that's the largest that they can be. And uh, nicely, we, we can, uh, our collaborators at Yale we, today uh, can manufacture this uh, device at this scale. So here, the, the scale bar is two microns, which is about the wavelength that we're scanning it at. And so we're developing uh, these, we can develop these patterns at the scale of interest, uh, which is about the wavelength. That looks, that looks periodic, I mean, regular to me. Yeah, so this pattern here isn't actually the, the exact few more Okay. It's very good to pick that up, by the way. It's not exactly the Morse. Uh, so, but we need, well, since we're doing it numerically and analytically, what we want to do is develop some sort of tool which can analyze the structure. Right? So, and we want a way to guide the experiments and, and make predictions as to what they uh, should expect. So, as I mentioned, the pattern is not random, and uh, we have to account for wave interference, so we're not going to jump to the diffusion approximation. And the type binding, which works well for one dimension, is not as clear in two. Because even though you, you see these uh, regions where there are two by two vacancies, there's places where energy could build up. Uh, and I've highlighted these here in purple just to, to highlight where I'm talking about. But in these micro cavities, we'll call them, uh, energy could build up. And you could possibly uh, say that this, uh, this one here will couple, couple to the other cavity. But if I want to apply the type bonding model, I need to define what is the nearest neighbor and what's the next nearest neighbor for this pattern. And so for any given site, it has to have some sort of nearest neighbor, but which of the sites should be considered nearest neighbor? But wouldn't you expect that many universal features uh, would be rather robust against this precise definition of what neighbors you take? I mean, details will, of course, depend on it. But uh, I would expect that if it's really the quasi-periodicity that's, that's changing the physics, mm -hmm. then it should not depend too much on how you define your label precisely. So you're proposing if we uh, define some other set of nearest, well, I'll come up with a definition for nearest neighbors, and if I define something else as a nearest neighbor set, then it should be also the same. Yeah. Maybe not the same, but, but you, many, many, many universal many features, features should, 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 should be the same. Yes. So I, I should no longer think about this as, as wave scattering off of these centers. Right, you're just exciting this system. But now, yeah, now I have nodes where it's where all the amplitude is, or not, in yeah. the case maybe. Right, okay. Right. But uh, the yes, yeah, so we haven't run that test, but that's uh, makes sense. So what we, if you stare at this pattern for a long enough time, you'll see uh, that there are rows and columns which don't have any of these micro cavities. So I kind of latch onto that feature. And if you remove those, as so I remove the, the rows and remove the columns, we get back, surprisingly enough, a periodic system. This is very interesting because we started out with something aperiodic, and we have an algorithmic way of reducing it back to a periodic map. The advantage of doing this is once you have a periodic uh, set of arrangements, you can clearly define what is a nearest neighbor and what's the next nearest neighbor. So here I've highlighted the nearest neighbors in red and green and black, uh, brown. And, and the nearest neighbors to what? I'm oh, sorry. So for the, a given site here, yes. there's four nearest neighbors to it. And, and then for this site here, there's four nearest neighbors. And then the next nearest neighbor would be this one. So for a given site, there's four nearest neighbors and four next nearest neighbors. And what I'm highlighting here. I don't understand at all. I'm sorry. I have to do that a little bit more slowly or something. Uh -huh. so. 
So if I choose a micro cavity and I want to ask where are the nearest micro cavities uh, to so that? So now site. you're focusing on the cavities, and you're saying what cavities are the nearest neighbors to right. my micro cavity? I right, look at the green guy there. This one. That one. Okay. So this is also green. <laughs> so this is. Let's yeah. pick one. I don't yeah, care. Okay. I'm going to pick this one, yeah. and I'm going to say to this micro cavity, where are the four nearest neighbors? Okay. And I'm going to highlight that there are four of them, but I'm just going to, for this instance. Pick these two. Okay. <laughs> so, see so that color it. really doesn't mean an awful lot. Exactly. That's yeah. what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just misleading. It's <laughs> a <laughs> distraction. So. Yeah. Okay. So that's an that's a nearest neighbor. Right. Well, you'll see why I have the deal. But the brown guy uh, above him is the next nearest neighbor. Well, we should look at the two pairs this, of each These two sites here are nearest neighbors. Two examples these two of are nearest neighbors. Right. Right. And these two are nearest neighbors. Right. I see. But these two down here, these are next nearest neighbors to each other. Yes. yes and so these okay. are next nearest neighbors. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> introduce why this is interesting, <laughs> why I colored this uh, next here. So we're going to take this uh, periodic site. Now that we've identified what are nearest neighbors and next nearest neighbors, then we're going to reintroduce our expansion uh, of the original Thumor's pattern by adding back in these rows and columns. Now, why would I do this? Because there are, it turns out, just three distinct nearest neighbor type couplings. So between here and here, which were formerly ne nearest neighbors, they're coupled by this pattern of, of scatters, right? And these nearest neighbors are still uh, coupled by a different one, different uh, type of coupling between the scatters. Right? And so it turns out that there's three distinct patterns of nearest neighbor couplings. And so back in the original Thumor's pattern, it might not be obvious, but now we've picked out how the nearest neighbors are coupled to each other and how the next nearest neighbors are coupled. And we find that there's only three distinct types for each. So this is uh, an interesting result. It tells us that we're going to be able to apply the uh, type binding model uh, very, very easily. So you now write down the type binding model, keeping all those couplings that you defined as being uh, nearest neighbors and maybe next nearest neighbors on, on the reduced lattice, right. and assigning different values to the on, on, uh, uh, on how they uh, actually look like in the in the original. Right. Okay. So and this is this. Is, yeah, it's only one way of doing this, but I don't think uh, it's a unique mm -hmm. way of doing this. You're saying the results that we find are should apply to any similar types of, of couplings. But. Uh, so but that this, in the, in the this seems to be a natural way of doing this. If you look at if you look at the picture, then you see that now you have uh, things coupled that are further apart than mm -hmm. some others that you don't couple. Exactly. And my, my guess would be that uh, uh, if you would couple the others, not much would really change. Okay. Right? That's a good guess. But, but you're going to map this now onto a tight binding model in which your sites are the micro cavities. Yes. Exactly. Right. Okay. So when we do that, then we can develop the Hamiltonian. But we have a bit of a problem, right? So that. We substitute each of these nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor couplings into a Hamiltonian, and we could diagonalize that to find the eigenstates of the system. But there's a bit of an issue because, in addition to these two by two micro cavities, which we were looking at previously, there are size one by one and, and one by two size micro cavities. So we're going to have to some, come up with some way of getting a more accurate uh, a product system that can I mean, use the same. So you could throw them out, right? I mean, you throw out couplings that are the same length than, than the ones that you keep. Right. So you could you could throw out the small cavities and see what happens. Right? Yeah, yeah, That's not right. Now, this this mapping of, of these pictures onto this equation, you have the C I J I prime J prime. Mm -hmm. uh, which is what is psi this is this is just the two dimensionality of it, is the I and J? Right. Right. Okay. So so, so you're go I'm going from the, the brown one to the next brown one, you've got these two dots that indicate some sort of coupling. Right. And that you have to come up with a number which to put right. into your equation. Yeah. Are you gonna talk about that? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So that, We'll, we'll show how we did that after we overcome this issue here of the okay. other cavities. So in our, in our two-dimensional Dumor's pattern, we have a, a given Fourier transform for that spatial arrangement. And what we notice is that it's self-similar, right? And so we want to keep that while uh, addressing the other issues that we want to get rid of. So the first thing we do to get rid of all the non-two-by-two uh, two cavities is just fill them in. And with that, we're just left with uh, this pattern here, spatially, and the Fourier transform of that has some additional period periodicity that these extra lines are included. That's where those are coming from. But we still have a self-similar Fourier transform, so we're retaining 
the a periodicity of the structure. And, and the reason is that the two by two cavities themselves are arranged in, in, in an aperiodic fashion. Right? Exactly, right. But now we have a, a second issue, right, that we have to overcome, which is that these cup, these cavities here are very close to each other, and they're actually coupling, uh, and then they'll form independent states. So we want to have some way of, of isolating these from each other so then they don't hybridize. The way that we do that is we introduce a row of scatters between each of the uh, rows and columns. And once we did that, uh, we checked that the Fourier transform is still self-similar. So, so we have a uh, periodicity from these extra rows and columns. But as Dr. Vorda said, these uh, arrangement of the cavities are still aperiodic. And we can see that from the Fourier spectrum. I didn't quite get why, why, have to do, why do you have to do the second step? So what's wrong with this, this working with this? Because if you excite one of these modes, they, well, here, this one is, is uh, isolated enough from the other ones that if you excite this one, it uh, remains isolated. Whereas if you they introduce energy into here, it's going to leak into these other cavities because they're so close. But so you don't have a... Isn't this what you want? I mean, if they're all completely isolated, then... Right. The, you know, what do you want? You want them isolated or you want them to connect it? I mean, well, you want to be able to excite them uh, so that they have... If you have, say, 40 different eigenmodes, 40 different eigenstates, sorry, 40 different cavities, then you actually want 40 different eigenmodes of the system. So if you, if your cavities are too uh, close together, they don't form independent eigenstates. Nonsense. You get two of them. But I mean, you take, you take, you know, if, you, if this is a cavity which is you're associating some amplitude with, and this one, and there's a coupling between them, if I diagonalize that two by two system, I get two, two eigenstates. Right, but it's here, they're so close that they actually are indistinguishable. And there's not enough separation between them to, to see that. Well, that you that you don't see them means they're delocalized over the over that combined cavity in a certain sense. Right. But I'm having a hard time seeing why that's necessarily a bad thing. But uh, as long as it's localized to that region and not you know over there or something like that, then you can see localization or delocalization across the system. But Right, uh, so for this system of say five scatter, five micro cavities, it would kind of form one. I mean, you would get five nearly indistinguishable uh, states that are they they do have distinct. You'd have five different energies, right? But they're very close together, and so we're looking forward to increase that separation. But that's a quantitative uh, change, yeah. Not a qualitative one, right? Because if you have, if you have, if you have always uh, there are states for the entire system, right? And then. If you, if you have a tight grinding model, then you really cannot separate out a single, a single cavity. You will never have individual eigenstates, maybe approximately, but not in right. not really. Unless you have sites that are effectively uncoupled from everybody else, right. they, you know, then, then they will by themselves be, be eigenstates. But, uh, so, so is this driven by experiment because they are more weakly coupled in experiment? Well, I'm, not quite, I'm not quite sure why, what, what would be wrong with this just looking at what happens here? I don't see what the qualitative difference is. Uh, if we, if we excite one of these modes, we don't want to excite. We want to be able to excite this one without uh, introducing uh, the same amount of energy into all the other nearby cavities. The, this isn't an experimental result, but if we do a console simulation, which I'll show you next, we actually see how these are, are hybridized. Okay, let's, let's see what happens here. So we introduce extra rows and columns, and then we get we retain our aperiodicity, which is the essential physics that we're after. So when we uh, excite, so when yeah, but the, the result of this is that you've got a set of fully separated cavities that form an aperiodic structure. Exactly. Okay. They're distinct from one another. Okay. And so when we, uh, we we see what the energy uh, stored in one of these uh, micro cavities is, and then we can, um, we're using our param the parameters for this are coming from uh, a gallium arsenide membrane from our experimental collaborators, and then we can look at uh, for a given eigenstate of the system with all of these couplings. So this is a, a numerical model that's independent of our uh, coupling coefficients that we saw before, but this is uh, the same pattern that we, we saw, saw in the last slide. Uh, so, so, I'm, I'm lost. Thanks. <laughs> so, so, so these are now nine cavities that you are looking at here? On, 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 on uh, but what are the states and what are the cavities? And I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, yeah. understanding the picture, I, I suppose. And it's a little dark. Mm -hmm. So, so where are the cavities here? All right. So, what we're taking is this pattern here, and exciting to see what the eigenstates of the system are. 
And so here there is uh, say, So how many cavities are in the right picture? Say before one, one, two, three, four, that's 16, and then there's one, two, four, five, 25 of the five uh, size. So it's 16 plus 25. 41. Sorry. No, it should be 40. 40. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> 40 modes. 40 uh, cavities in the system. So this is a solution to a set of tight binding equations with 40 sites? Is that not, not yet, no. So this is just uh, so that arrangement of scatters. Uh, this is an eigenstate of that system. What, is, what <laughs> do you what solve? System? You can't have an eigenstate you unless you have a Hamiltonian, you know. So uh, I, I don't know what the underlying system that this is a solution to. Solution of what? What equation? You said not tight binding. You told me that, but it's something else, I guess. So this is a numerical simulation of the arrangement of scatters that we're finding the eigenvalues. Maxwell equation. Right. So this is a yeah, the arrangement is a geometrical thing. Right. But the, these uh, light blue and dark blue and yellow and orange things, those are presumably re represent amplitudes or squared yeah, amplitudes. Amount of energy. Yeah. It's, it's the energy obtained from solving Maxwell's equations. I infer from your thesis. <laughs> uh, right. This is a photonic system. So, right. So you're just solving the wave equation, I guess, right? Yeah. yeah. And 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 your scatterers are now modeled as something else. They're not tight binding sites anymore. They're right. So so what is it? Are these these um, disks or are they? Uh, I mean, yeah. So these are holes drilled in a dielectric material. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> so I drill holes in the dielectric yeah, material. Yes. So now you have a, a, a difference in the refractive index, right? The air gap holes right and hole. the dielectric material. Okay. Got it. And so, so you solve Maxwell's equations for this, and you get these patterns. Yes. Okay. Right. So now, what we want to do is, once we have these states, we want to characterize how you know, they extended or localized, and some way of uh, figuring that out. But where there's sorry, where's the connection of this way of, of looking at the problem to the tight binding we were talking before? Uh, then this become clear later because this is you are not using right, any right, right. approximation here. So what we're doing is we're establishing that we can figure out. So remember you asked before like how are we actually going to find what those coupling coefficients are? Right. right? And so this is. And you want to extract it from something like that. Exactly. Okay. Right. So this is why we're doing it is to right. figure out okay. what the values of those coupling coefficients are for a real system. Okay. Why not just do this? Compared to what? So why do you need to type binding model? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Why, exactly. Why, not, why not do this? So this is going to be able to tell us what the eigenstates are, and we're going to. Uh, so, so you can't put gain and absorption in this. Is that part? Yeah, we can. Yeah. So, so why not just do this? As compared. So we, I mean, is this the first thing you're showing us, and you're using this to derive a tight binding model, which seems further away than from your photonic system? Is the question how, how, how do you want to do bigger systems, or what, why right, do you yeah. use the tight binding model at all if you can do this? Right. right. So the here we're limited. So we picked 40 by 40, and we're running it on a so a plus. A, 24 CPU cluster with something like 48 gigabytes of RAM. But if we actually want to see how this scales with the size of the system, then we can't say simulate 128 by 128 size. Got it. Okay. So this becomes numerically difficult for you to do. Exactly. You because want to do, this you do small systems, extract the parameters, define a high binding model, and this you can scale. Right. right. Okay. Because okay. here, this is using the finite difference time domain, and this is computationally complex. Right. Right. So what are we going to use in order to? So these eigenstates here of the system have some sort of uh, some sort of dependence on, on whether they have either localized or extended, and we can measure that by using what's called the inverse participation ratio. This just comes from measure of the intensity, and what it tells you is that if the effective volume that you calculate is near the size of the actual system volume, then that state is extended. And if, it, if we had disor random disorder, it would be called diffusive. But and then if your effective volume scales with some characteristic length, like the localization length, then we call it localized. So we're going to measure the inverse participation ratio. And then we can apply these, these couplings that we found the numerical values for from COMSOL into our uh, Hamiltonian and diagonalize it. Numerical values from. So we're going to find these coupling coefficients. Remember, there's three coupling coefficients, but we actually need to find the numerical values before right. putting them into the Hamiltonian. Right. Once we've done that, then we can diagonalize that and find the states of the system. So what we're showing here is the uh, the inverse participation ratio. If it's near, uh, if the ratio of that to the volume is near one, then it would be uh, extended, and if it goes towards zero, then it's uh, becoming more localized. So this is the scale here. 
and then this is the density of states. And what I'm showing here in this 8 by 8 scale plot is an uh, uh, arrangement of scatters which is very small. And so I need to know what the nearest neighbors for each of those sites are. So for each site has four nearest neighbors, and I go through, I've written a script that can tell for a given site which of these couplings each site has. There's going to be four nearest neighbors. And then there's another set of information, the nearest, next nearest neighbors, and those types of couplings. And so I'm feeding those in, and we find uh, the inverse participation ratio. But and then, as we pointed out, we want to see how this scales with the size of the system. So this is where we're increasing from, say, 8 by 8 to 32 by 32, and then uh, 128 by 128 micro cavities. And so we can see there's some sort of behavior here, which well, we need a baseline to figure out, is that unusual or you know normal, expected or not? And so for comparison, now, but have, have you explained how you actually extract these tight binding couplings from, from, from the solution before? Did I miss this? Or? From the from the COMSOL simulation? What's COMSOL? I'm oh, sorry. This is, these, uh, these here are the COMSOL simulation results. So this is kind of a, like our quasi one dimensional numerical model. It's very abstracted, whereas COMSOL, you're actually supplying, say, the, the values from your gala and your arsenide. Uh, numbering. Yeah, so you just didn't use the phrase before, so I didn't know the term console, so you said. So, so from these, you do something, right? And you get the numbers? Okay, so we're getting the actual coupling coefficients from this simulation, but with the uh, parameters from a real physical system of gallium arsenide. Uh, so so can, can, you, can you explain in three sentences how you do that? Because these are, the, I see wave functions or amplitudes maybe, right? So how do you go from those to the, to the coupling parameters in the tight binding model that you want to uh, match to this, right? Is it, can this be explained in, in, in simple terms? No. Uh, so no, I did not do that. Uh, so no, I'm not able to explain that very well. So, so you took that from somebody else who's done that. Those numbers yeah. were given to you in a certain sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. Uh, so now we have this. Uh, but this is you now. Yeah. Well, you're taking those numbers and you're running all this. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. So yeah. now we're, we're, what we're doing is we're taking the inverse participation ratio and say the density of states these differently sized systems, but we're not sure if this behavior here, we see it's uh, states are extended, which are near zero, and then they localize, but we need some way of comparing that. And so what we do is we've taken those same coupling coefficients, uh, and then for the, uh, we've uh, scrambled them. And so we've taken all the different positions where those coupling coefficients were and changed them randomly. Right, so this isn't a purely random system. But we've changed all the coupling coefficient positions, right? So they're spatially scrambled. And this is our, our baseline of uh, whether or not this is unusual behavior. And so when we scramble all of those co coupling coefficients, then we see that it's not the same. And this tells us that even though we have the same coupling coefficients, there's a dependence on the position of those. And so we can attribute this to the a period system. Right. It's pretty the correlations, right? Yes. right. This is what you're right. saying. Yeah. But uh, just to understand some of this stuff. So uh, up at the top, the 8 by 8, I see these well-separated points. And you're going to get more of them, of course. But, right. but now in the bottom one, you see they, they seem to fall in vertical lines. So at the same energy or same frequency, I guess, yeah. you've got states with a variety of localization lengths is what that's telling yes. you, right? Yes, okay. So that's what I'll actually point out next is that I'm going to look at, say, a specific instance of the eigenstate here and here and see what those look like in, in space. So what we see when we look at specific states uh, of this system is that there's a coexistence. So for a given pattern, we can pick out extended and localized states in the same configuration. This is a bit surprising because a random configuration of, of disorder would either be classified as diffusive or localized. Right? It's not going to be the both at the same time. At a given energy or a given frequency. Right. right. So this is a, a bit of a surprise in that our apratic systems have some unusual behavior. So that's, that's that good. Right. But what does this actually mean in terms of transport behavior? So this is, now Now we, we saw in the Fourier transform this unusual uh, spectrum, and we saw there's a coexistence of extended and localized states. But what does this actually mean to someone who's doing an experiment with these apratic systems? And, and these are typical states, right? You have not handpicked the one single state that is, is localized or diffusive. I, I did pick out uh, states that are exhibiting uh, localization. Yeah. So you can see here there's some exponential slope, and this I did have to hunt for, but it's, yeah, this is, you can find instances of this throughout the system. But, but the measure for both sets of state is finite. So, so, the, uh, so if you really look at a large system, you would find lots of localized right. and lots of extended states. Yeah. Okay. 
But there's a sense in which even this this uh, localized state uh, is extended over a um, hundred sites, right, or something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's localized, but not in, it's not really really strongly localized. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason I picked up this one was because in our one-dimensional systems, we look at what are called necklace states. And this is where you have some sort of uh, tunneling in, and then to another site of localization. So this is a yeah, an example of a necklace state yeah. here. So yeah. You can find, uh, say, a perfect What's the necklace state. I'm going to say it again. So, if you have one center of localization, one place where you have uh, a decrease on both sides, yeah. this would be a single localized state. Right. But if you superimpose two of those, right, in the same exactly. system, but at different still an eigenstate, state, right? Right. Yeah. So this would be called a necklace state when you have two or more yeah. different uh, localized states in the same system. Yeah. That's that's what this is showing. Is that there's you can clearly see a necklace state. Uh, two. Yeah. Right, but if I take all the other states with this same frequency, uh, can I not form linear combinations of those that are single ones? Or is this, I mean, as you say, if I can, if I have a pair of these things, right. uh, they're going to be orthogonal, of course, but I add and subtract them, can I, pre now the question is, what's the most localized state you can produce out of the states of the, of the same energy? Well, maybe before you go there, uh, are these truly precisely degenerate, or are they just have the same energy within your numerics? I think that's important for both. Yeah, 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 right. That's, right. that's a good because point. Because if they are truly degenerate, right, then you can form arbitrary linear combinations, and they should again be eigenstates. But if they are only uh, roughly at the same energy within your numerics, but actually not quite degenerate, then the question would kind of move. Yes, 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 that's yeah. true. Yeah. So can, 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 can you tell that, or is it something that's beyond your numerics to say? So what, yeah, so what you're asking is, is the frequency of all these in the same, uh, is, it, is it the same frequency exactly? Right. So is, is there any mechanism that makes them fully degenerate, or are they just happen to be uh, as approximately the same energy? I'm not sure on that. But, uh, I haven't looked at that specifically. Right. And then, so, so you're plotting, but when you look at the actual the list of energies or frequencies, right. uh, they're numerically the same to six digits, or you just have you just plot them up and didn't really look at the numbers? Or yeah, I haven't. I haven't I mean, this is really recent. I mean, this was in the past week or two, okay. so yeah, I haven't looked at that. Uh, Hmm? They're different. Yeah, they're not totally different. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, right. And it's still, still not interesting, right? Yeah. Because there's still no, no yeah, sharp yeah, ability. Yeah, that's right. right. That's that's right. Exactly right. They're, they're intermingled, right? Yeah. I, uh, I've got one yeah. quick question. You've got the, uh, for your diffusive, you know, it's it's basically spread pretty evenly, except a couple of, of like, nodes in there. Uh, what what does that mean? Is there any meaning to that at all? Uh, so th this is there's some scale dependence. So that, uh, this is a relatively small system of eight, uh, 40 by 40 actually. So I think this would be uh, it. It may have some dependence on the size of the system. So, so you're asking where are these points coming from? What do they mean physically, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not sure if this is uh, just due to the size of the system. You can see there's some sort of symmetry going on here. Uh, I'm not sure if that's just a I mean, this is a, it's an enormous vertical scale, right? Yeah, Amplified right. scale, right? So this thing could, th these things could sort of look sinusoidal-like in a certain sense. And this is just a point where it's going, you know, it's a node, right? right. And uh, it's just right. dropping off that. Right. Yeah. 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 So I'm not sure. To answer your question, I'm not sure. Uh, so what I want to look at, though, is, is to see what does this actually mean for physical transport properties? And so one thing that we can always look at is transmission uh, in the system. So for random systems, they obey what's called single parameter scaling. And this is the idea that if, if you tell me what the average conductance of your random system is, I can tell you about the entire distribution of that, uh, uh, all the higher moments of that. And in terms of photonics, we're talking about transmission instead of conductance. The same rule applies. And does it hold for three more? Right? And but in order to answer that, when you build up an, uh, a distribution that implies you have an ensemble to work from, and you'll notice the two Morse pattern just generates one dimensional array. And so you have to pick out how are you going to develop your ensemble uh, from different configurations of this. So what we've done is we've taken the two Morse pattern, the original two Morse 2D array, and we select, say, a subregion of that. And this is going to form uh, our set of uh, scatter positions for our numerical model of the trans he's applying the transfer matrix method. So we're going back to that, that same model we use in the, in the random system. Now if we move this window up into a different region of the 2D array, we can pick out a distinct set of scatterers arrays. And so we repeat this process over and over, developing 
a set of unique scalar positions for our quasi-1D waveguide. If the waveguide is only five scalars wide, then the best kind of two to the five Right. Yeah, so, so is, you're not going to get a, a very large ensemble for a given waveguide size, but uh, you can build up enough to develop to, to say that you have something that constitutes a. So these ensemble. are non-overlapping regions that you take, or do no, you? It's do not you that they're non-overlapping; it's that they're distinct from one another. Right. So well, they're, they're certainly distinct, but d that's what I'm asking: Do you purposely make them non-overlapping, or do you actually just shift them up by one? Well, so region? when I'm, what I have to do is search through this two-dimensional two morse pattern for unique sequences. And when I'm shifting this window, I'm actually just shifting it by one uh, row because I would find the, the unique scatters quickest. But. Oh, I see. Okay. So you're selecting out the unique sequences from, from this thing. Okay. Right. And the important thing is that each of these, they're not specifically two-dimensional few Morse arrays, but they retain some sort of the uh, physics uh, of the 2D arrays, so, so the symmetries that we pick out in the few Morse pattern. Yeah, but I can imagine an ensemble where I'm simply randomly selecting something out of here, and then I get a sequence. Select. Yeah, I just I just define the size of this thing, and I throw it down at random in your in your system. And now I say, okay, I, I, I pluck, pluck something out of there. And I can do this again and again. Yeah. And these unique sequences will come out, but there'll be multiples of them, right? So they'll be weighted by different amounts. The the ones that reoccur more often than others is sort of a more isn't that a better statistical sampling of your system rather than equally weighting all unique sequences? Yes, but it's. Uh, I, I see what you're saying. If you pick out, if you uh, sample your two-dimensional Fumarus pattern and find the distribution of, say, non I guess it'd be the distribution of unique sequences for yeah, each. Yeah, yeah. It's a number of each, whether, how many right. different ones you have, and then there's a, a, a certain unique sequences will occur a certain number of times, and that's right. a weight that you could mm -hmm. put to it. And that's not what you're doing, just to be clear. Correct. Okay. But it, it, it would be another way of developing an ensemble, and be useful to see whether or not this gives the same result yeah. as we'll see next. It's very tricky, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, how do you define an ensemble? If you're interested in a transpose the total thing, and shouldn't you weight it not by the occurrence, but by the inverse conductance or so? Yeah, yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's very tricky. <laughs> So the trick is, with any of those, do we actually see anything unique? And, and the answer turns out is yes, definitely. So for random systems, if you take any random system, whether it's randomly placed in the waveguide or random on lattice, or any of these, it'll always fall on this universal curve, uh, regardless of the width of the waveguide. Was it? So the, what are you plotting? I'm sorry. So yeah, so this, this curve here on the axis is the average conductance or the transmission in terms of electronic system, and this is the variance of the conductance. And on, the, on this plot, all random systems will fall on this aqua line, which is coming from a, a prediction. And we see that's true. Our, our square symbols here are the uh, random media that we've, predict, that we've uh, calculated the different conductances for. And you can get a different conductance when you change the size of your waveguides. We're making our waveguides longer or shorter to get different, different values of conductance. And then from that random system ensemble, we can find the variance. Second one. But wouldn't one, before doing something like that, first ask the question about uh, how the conductance uh, scales with length? Uh, does it go down exponentially, or, or does it go down like a power law, or maybe it doesn't, yeah. does it go down at all? Right, so you, uh, so you could look at also, so that what you're asking is how does the conductance scale as a function of the length for the random, and compare that to the two right, right. right, so you could also do that. Yeah. Uh, so is this something you have done or plan to do? Or? We will be doing this. Yeah. Okay. So it, because it's relatively easy, right? You just increase the length of your system and exactly. get back to your yeah. conductance. But this is nice because what it shows us is all random systems fall on this universal curve, whereas the few Morse pattern, based on this ensemble that we developed, does not. And it, there's also a width dependence. So all the circles here are different few Morse pa uh, patterns. And unfortunately, I use the same symbol for the different widths, but we can pick out that there's some sort of trend line here. It's uh, one one of the straight lines is for the width of 10 wavelengths for our waveguide, and then we have a shorter, uh, yeah, a shorter waveguide width of just five wavelengths, and that shorter different width, yeah. Narr narrower waveguide, yeah, narrow, smaller. So, but all these uh, data points are just the conductance for a given uh, ensemble of a specific length of the waveguide and a specific width. And we can see they fall on distinct curves that are very different than what you would see in a random system. So this is our kind of surprising prediction that you're gonna that the distribution of conductance won't be the same. Even though the two Morris is kind of a, you can think of it as a subset of random media, 
is not obeying this universal uh, prediction for random media. So this is our, our prediction that conductance will behave differently. And we could look at, for example, the uh, scaling with length, which we have for the random system, of course. Right. So to summarize, we have seen unusual behavior in the Fourier spectrum, and we, that caused us to think, well, there's probably something going on elsewhere in the transport properties. So we saw that there's localized and extended states coexisting, and we've measured an anomalous distribution of transmission. So this, this is our uh, interesting results. The way that we did this is we applied the type bonding model to our two-dimensional Thumor survey, and then we also used our previous numerical model for the transfer matrix method to measure conductance. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Can I have way down in line? Oh. Hello? Um, hello? Hi. Can you hear me or not? We can hear you now. Okay, good. So what is the procedure uh, with the asking questions in public or we, have a, we ask questions in the closed session? Oh, if you have a questions to them now, you can ask them, and uh, if not, then, then we'll, uh, we'll have a discussion just among the, uh, the committee members. Oh, okay, okay, fine. So let me ask a few questions. Okay. So uh, let's go to uh, page, um, okay, so page 33. Uh, no, actually, it's, uh, it's kind of earlier. So, so, so this is for this, uh, uh, for, okay, sorry, actually, uh, let's go even earlier. That's page 28. 28. Okay. So, right, 28. You see that? Yeah. Okay, so I, I have a question. So I guess eventually you're, you're going to feel, feel this almost like a, I mean, you call it additional cavities, right? Like like one by two or two by one cavities. Right. right. So, but the real cavities, uh, like, um, these cavities come a uh, coefficient between nearest neighbor or second nearest neighbor. Uh, in this calculation, how do you feel this uh, void or you don't feel the void? Yeah, so w when we're identifying how, so the question is, are we uh, applying this nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor calculation before we fill in the cavities? And yes, the, this identification is based on the original two-dimensional through Morse pattern. So that's where this is coming from. Oh, I see. So basically, you, 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 you get this uh, common coefficient, uh, you know. So now the question is, what's the point of filling it or not filling it? You really don't change much things, right? Because you're you getting the type of money model. I know. You just uh, find this common coefficient between your neighbor and second your neighbor, right? So we, what we're doing is we're identifying, first we identify which are the nearest neighbors and next nearest neighbors. But when we actually yeah. find the numerical value for those coefficients, it's based on this pattern E here. In this, on slide 30, there's a figure E. Yeah. That's so, so that means you do that for E. That, that means you, 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 you calculate the coupling coefficient between nearest neighbor and the second nearest neighbor after you fill in those uh, kind of, you know, like one by two or two by one. Calculus, exactly. Right? That's where the numerical value from those coupling coefficients is coming from, yes. I see. Okay, okay, I see. So then the, I guess the question is that, uh, you know, I can see some of your uh, second and nearest neighbor uh, not too far from the third nearest neighbor. Right. Uh, say yeah. eight, right? Because uh, because it's the ATR system. Uh, so some of your second and nearest neighbor are pretty far. Uh, right, so the, the reason... The, the, that's, uh, that's too pink. Uh, that two pink uh, squares, uh, the next nearest neighbor, uh, you know, on page 28. So the question is, uh, did you see whether how that, I, I think what you're cutting all the even further uh, neighbor uh, couple, right? like the, not the next nearest neighbor, but the third nearest neighbor or I mean further. So how much difference in the coming constant between the next nearest neighbor, the, 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 the farthest one, and compared to the nearest Third nearest neighbor. You know what I'm saying? I think that's yep. pretty confusing. That's what it's confusing. Yeah, so the, the first question that arises is why would you even look at next nearest neighbors? And the answer in this case is if you look at the, the nearest neighbor, there's three types. 
and one's obviously very close, and the last one is the farthest apart in red. But the reason we need to include next nearest neighbors in the first place is because the the closest of those next nearest neighbors is actually closer than the, the largest of the nearest neighbors. So this is why we need. But what we haven't what we haven't looked at is uh, whether it's uh, perfectly acceptable to uh, only include next nearest neighbors. So I think what your question was is if we include say the next next nearest neighbors, how much of an attraction is that? And we haven't done that yet. Yeah, that's right. In other words, when you consider next next nearest neighbors. What do you have any of that kind of common coefficient is even larger than the smallest uh, uh, next nearest neighbor coming? Right. So what we have we have not done that, but what we did do was we compared if you take all three of the nearest neighbors and include the first of the next nearest neighbors, compare that mm -hmm. to the system where you're including all six of the coupling coefficients, and there you do see a little bit of a change, but it's not that significant. So we compared, say, all six coupling coefficients to just the first four, and there you, you recover a sufficient amount of uh, correct behavior. I see. Okay, that's, that's fine. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, so my second question is, uh, you can go to a uh, page, uh, uh, I actually, I look at this point, on um, page 27, uh, it's the previous one. Why did uh, you said this was not uh, periodic, this is periodic? I saw this experiment and uh, this, uh, this uh, FDA image and your pattern looks the same, right, or not? I'm uh, sorry, are you looking at the slide 25? 27. I don't have a slide 27, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, this, is one, this is one which you sent me. Um, maybe, oh yeah, this, uh, that's, uh, that's a 25 on your slide. Okay. Sorry. Someone like, speaking from the file you sent me. Okay, oh, fine. So this is a 25. Okay. Those two patterns are the same or not? No. The, the, the SEM image is not a Thu Morris pattern. So unfortunately, we didn't have an SEM image of the original Thu Morris pattern. And you can tell this isn't because it's not uh, showing the same micro cavity patterns as the. Uh, the pattern on the left that we. Oh, this, is, this, is a, this is a Fibonacci structure, right? Which you show at the end. What, what was that comment? Fibonacci? It's Fibonacci? I think it might be Fibonacci. Yeah. So it's okay. not Fibonacci. Right. But, but it's definitely right. not Fibonacci. Okay. Just, okay, um, okay, fine. So that's basically my question. Okay, then the next question is okay, now I have to be careful about my slide pages now. So uh, if you go to. Um, so I guess my question is, do you believe this is 31, or, or, or you can try to go in there to see whether that's close to the 31 or not? Yeah, here, here, here. Yeah, just here. So you did reduce the two by, I, I don't think you mentioned this, uh, or, or in, your, in your talk, you did reduce this two by two cavity to one by one cavity, right? Correct. Yeah. So can you explain why you do that? All right. So. On the previous slide, what we showed is that uh, taking the original Thu Morse pattern on, on slide 30, and then we, we want to reduce the non 2 by 2 cavities. We want to eliminate those. So we introduce, we fill in everything that's not a 2 by 2 micro cavity in, uh, in C and D. And then on slide E, we've introduced extra rows and columns to make sure that those uh, micro cavities are sufficiently separated from one another. And this is, we had a discussion about this earlier, is that it shouldn't be necessary, but it, it reduces the amount of coupling between the adjacent uh, micro cavities. No, 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 that's not my question. My, my question is that you also reduce the void, the this cavity, from like a made of two by two meeting holes to one by one, ah. only one meeting hole, right? Right. That just makes our, so it, it should be the same as if we hadn't reduced it, but it's just making our, our console simulation a bit easier because this size is just, just easier. smaller. Just easier. Uh, just Dan was not involved directly in this simulation, and there were two reasons why we've chosen a one by one. One is that uh, because uh, in the two by two you have multiple modes, and therefore tight binding approximation was just based on one mode per cavity would no longer apply. That was reason one. Number two is, is a, it's a photonic system, so the confinement is uh, due to a band gap effect. If there are too many cavities, if there are too much coupling, the cup, uh, they're split in energy so much that the energy of the hybridized cavities is outside of the band gap, and there's no longer confinement. 
So you have to make sure that the coupling is weak enough, so the splitting is small enough, so the resultant hybridized cavities are still inside the band gap of the background structure. I thought that that is the reason why you add additional force when you Yeah, so that's, that's, that seems that's to be the reason why you have yeah, to separate them. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, yeah, okay. I see. So, another question is just on this slide, like on page 30. So, you, I guess you're trying to say, uh, uh, you know, like this uh, from from D to I, I said this from D to F, the Fourier, no, just page the yeah. The the, the the question you were trying to say that we will think all this before, it still looks similar from the Fourier spectrum compared to B and the D. Right. Which is, which is, uh, I'm not so sure how we you you know. Looking by similar, I, I guess the question just looking by eyes, will you have any uh, particular measure to say they are looking similar, or there are still remaining single uh, continuous spectrum? You'll make all this modification. All right. So the, re the the reason that we claim that the two Morse pattern is some, somewhat similar to the uh, system where we filled in all the extra cavities is just by a visual analysis of the Fourier transform, and we we see that. Although we've introduced some extra periodicity, like there's there are rows which are completely filled in, and columns, and these are these are where the extra lines are coming in in the Fourier spectrum. But what we're after is it's the essential idea that of the uh, self-similar structure of the original Thue Morse Fourier transform. So that's what we wanted to preserve, and then when we see that, uh, our check is just that it visually looks similar. So we haven't actually uh, say analyze exactly how similar they are. Okay. So why in the B, I guess, it's just, I'm just curious, why in B you don't have this kind of, you know, like a line in the X and Y axis? Bec so in the original Thue Morse pattern, there are no uh, places where it's periodic. So the Thue Morse pattern is never periodic, whereas when we fill in, in in C, we suddenly have rows and columns which are perfectly periodic, and this is where those solid lines in the Fourier transform are coming from. But they appear aperiodically, even though you know, one column will right. be perfectly periodic, yes. and there'll be another column just like it somewhere else. Is that what happens? Well, here in the these perfectly filled in rows, those, of course, repeat uh, aperiodically, but they are right, themselves right. periodically. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Then, you see, I'm not so sure. Even you, you never have a, a one completely periodic row, but uh, if you see each row, it's like actually the periodicity. Maybe you, you're missing you know, we went so well, but I think if we put a chunk of I think we should see some peaks there. Yeah. In, in the you original Thue Morse pattern? You know, you see A? So that, on A? Uh, yeah, you can see, yeah, yeah, if you see along X axis. Right. So you still, even you, you never have a completely full, like a, like a, like a, like a, you know, line there, but uh, you know, I still think you should see some periodicity just along the X direction. Uh, what, what's, what would cause that? Because you still have an underlying, uh, you know, you still have an underlying lattice. Which I is see. You're taking away some force or some cylinders from an uh, underlying periodic lattice, right? All right. I, I see what you mean. So since the Thue Morris pattern is based on a periodic lattice, that's where we're putting the scatters, then, then you're saying we should expect there to be some sort of periodicity from the underlying lattice. Well, you know, you know, I saw periodicity along the X, you know, I'm really surprised that you are completely missing the x axis and the y axis. You know, like a, along the x axis and the y, you know, like the kx equals to something and the ky equals zero. There's nothing there. Right. Anyway, we first can tell this one later. I was a little bit surprised about that. Okay. The underlying lattice will make it uh, periodic in in k space, right? I mean, that's that's what the underlying lattice will do. Right. Yeah, that's right. Right. So, is that anyway. plot? That plot is intensity plot. Uh, right. it, it's when it's when you don't see anything it doesn't mean that it's uh, necessarily zero. It may be too small to see. Okay. Mm. Okay. I see. I think uh, I think uh, that's all my questions here. Uh, I, I I I think that's uh, yeah. I don't have any uh, further questions. Okay. All right. Then uh, mm -hmm. I think we'll we'll have a discussion just to, uh, among the. There, you know, if you guys have any questions then. before you would go, I mean, that'd be fun. No, no, no. All right.
Oh, wait, Ben. No, I have a few questions left for Ben. Sorry. Ben, ben, ben is supposed to stay. I only want to ask one more question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice try, Ben. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little surprised. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Okay. At the very beginning, you, you emphasized that uh, the, the advantage of working with photonic systems, uh, one of the advantages is that there is no Coulomb interaction because they are not charged, right? right. But th th then, of, uh, of course, everything you do is going on in the medium, and these are no, non-trivial media in the sense that they have gain, maybe, and they have absorption. Now, uh, shouldn't you also worry about nonlinear, uh, uh, nonlinear epsilon coefficient, which then would effectively lead to an uh, interaction between the photons? That's a good question. Yeah, so we're here, we're introducing the, the numerical gain in the, in the numerical model. It's just a linear uh, change. I understand that. But in, in the actual experimental application that you have in mind, uh, are the intensities low enough that you can neglect this, this effect of? Because it must be intensity dependent, right? right. So I haven't. Uh, we haven't actually compared our numerical results to the systems with gain, but we have with uh, absorption. So, do you have any feel for for this? Uh, yeah, it's uh, way too low for nonlinear to kick in. But okay. there, there are systems. We can get to nonlinear regime, and it definitely opens up the whole new, you know, right. field. And there's a lot of questions about the nonlinear effects, but. Uh, in practical system, that uh, level is so high that we there's a lot of room for us to work in the okay. linear regime. Okay. Yeah. Still, uh, your phase diagram. Can you go back to your yeah. multicolored phase diagram? That, that's fine. Just, okay. just that's okay. You, you mentioned that there are these other regions not on your diagram, but, but why not sort of show a bigger view that shows the whole? All right. So the the, the most in, on this phase diagram. So the question is, why do we not show the entire phase diagram? And the reason is, is because these two get squeezed too. Yeah, the interesting like behavior, that. which we actually <laughs> want to point out, is this Anderson localization regime, which occurs uh, very close to the passive axis. So if you have very low amounts of absorption, this is where you see all these different transport regimes, whereas the scale at which you actually see, say, these two lines converge and, and the different transport regimes up, off axis, those are very far away, and so you have to look at the scale where these would basically be on the axis. I mean, it's so, oh. the scale is... But, you know, look at, your, look at your ordinate there, 1 over n squared and then L over LA. Couldn't you just sort of draw another sort of arbitrary line up there, which is when this parameter and that parameter are <laughs> going to be on? I mean, sure, so yeah. It should be in, it should be in a thesis. Oh, is, it, is it in there? Right, maybe I it, it's, in a, it's in one of the papers that are. Oh, in it's the in the paper. Okay, okay. okay. It's not in the introduction. Okay. Oh, okay. There, there you go. You're looking at it now. Okay. okay. Oh, I see. Okay. It's a lower portion, and there is upper then, portion. Oh, so you break it out. Okay, fine. fine. I, I didn't actually see that. Good. That, that's, that's, that's one of my questions. But the other thing is, I understand what you've drawn lines on here, right? And these lines, uh, are, these are lines are based upon your C0 and C2. Is that is is that true? No. The, so I, I don't quite understand how you actually draw one of these lines. Okay. Right. Yeah. So the question is, where do these actual boundary conditions come from for these different transport regimes? And the answer is, and this, by the way, was done before the numerical simulation, so completely independent. This is our our first initial result in this parameter space. Is we developed this prediction. So I just want to point out that it's independent of our numerical results. So the way that we come up with this is by figuring out what are the characteristic transport lengths that you care about, right? And so one of the, in the passive system, you have the transport mean free path and the localization length, right? And these are compared to the size of the system, so the length of our waveguide. But when you introduce, say, the, the absorption, then you have the absorption length, right? And this is just by permuting the different inequalities, like let's say your system length is longer than your transport free path, but shorter than... So uh, it's just something becoming larger or smaller than one as I cross one of those. Yes. Every one of those, I'm, it, one of something's becoming larger or smaller. Yeah, this is, yeah. so you go through all these different characteristic lengths and permute the inequalities and see which one's larger and which one's smaller. And that's uh, one set of boundaries, so it's all these straight lines here. And these other set of lines come from an analysis of the frequency space. So if you look at what the size of uh, your, your your state is in the system. So, sorry, if you I don't have it with me. If you look at how the conductance changes as a function of frequency, you see there's some oscillations, right? And these oscillations are actually indicating underlying states in the uh, frequency space. So the size of your uh, state is uh, visible from the conductance, but not directly. So 
we have to look at uh, what the what these frequency space uh, peaks are, how how widely separated are they from one another, and uh, what the average distance between them is. And uh, I don't have that picture. Is this in. the square chain? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So this is a ratio of the uh, mode width, the width to the separation. mode separation. Got it. And then you also have to, so that's these two, and then there's another parameter which tells it how much gain there is because as you introduce more absorption of the system, they're going to get narrower. Right? And so there's another interplay. In addition to all these characteristic lengths, then you also have this other Dallas criterion analysis with absorption. But, but that, that criterion means that you need to know what the conductance is as a function of frequency, uh, as you say. And, and, and then that means, but you said these are independent of numerical calculations. So I don't know uh, how. Didn't you have to do some numerical calculations to determine what those are? Or are these are in the. These are the, the criterion in the passive system that define the parameter, I yeah. guess. Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay. So all these are... Okay. I guess I understand. Well, no, not quite. No? The, you, you the mode width does have... The mode width so that you can estimate from a passive system and then add ad hoc ab absorption to say... Uh, absorption broadens the line, right? Wait, wait, which you know characteristically how a line gets broadened with absorption. Right, right, right. 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 Just an additional time. source right. of, of uh, dissipation. Okay. So as far as actual numeric values, we're not calculating those. We're, we're looking at the functional relation. Okay. So that's where this is coming from. And then once you have all those boundaries, then you can... And, and you didn't really talk about gain in this talk, by the way, right? Exactly. You, you, you talked right. about absorption, but you've talked to us about gain. Well, so, so our, our parameter space prediction for this 2D parameter space extends into the gain because it's kind of, it's, it's not exactly the opposite of absorption, but you can kind of think of it in those terms. But uh, So our parameter space prediction is for non-conserved media, which includes absorption and gain, but our numerical simulations we've only done so far for uh, diffusive and somewhat localized systems with absorption. So let's let me skip ahead over to the actual comparison with the results. That's why we're only looking at say, the upper part of the axis here. Right. So, so this is the, the, this pink and purple curve is one you'd sort of expect based upon just analysis of parameters in different regimes, and you get pictures that seem to have similar right. structures in them. Exactly. Right, right, right. So we, we do want to extend this into the systems with absorption and strong localization. Or sorry, with a gain and strong localization. And, and the fact that. Um, the, the, they say, well, no, I will say that. Let me just say, uh, yeah. So, so the so the, the plots, the, the the curves that you're putting on your new your your these lines, these boundaries that you're drawing in there between the different colored regions, those are based on what? Simply I or uh, no, is no, that no. question? So, so if we take this plot here. These all these boundaries, these lines. You're just superimposing, superimposing them with no fitting parameters. Right, right, right. We're surprised because there's such good agreement. I mean, so you so you extract the lengths from your numerical experiments, right. and then you, you draw you know, the, the lines line. based on those lengths, and, and okay. Exactly. But the, but the lines somehow look different to me than this, right? I, I don't quite. I mean, uh, where right. scale? So this is a. Uh, is there a log scale here? So this is why it's not. What's a log scale? You've gone from a. Yeah. That's a linear scale on top? Yes. Yeah, so this is why the block sizes here you can see are changing. Right. So this hump that I see very prominently in the top. Right. So it doesn't show up. It's scale. very, very modest. Okay. Okay. Oh, I still have to go back to the. The intensity? The, the, yeah. <laughs> I, I've been <laughs> thinking about this through the whole thing. <laughs> Me too, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, that I, you know, you're you're giving us the z component, which is along the propagation along the you know of the flux, and you're saying that that is a constant throughout, which I'm not sure I even understand why that would be a constant. I would think it, the it should, has to go through if it wants to come out at the end. Yeah, right? that that suggests to me that everything that goes in must come out the right. other end. Yeah. And and I don't understand that at all. And then yeah. if that's true, I don't understand how the intensity can change if that's happening. So something something doesn't fit my my uh, rational mind here. All right. So uh, let, let, let me try to understand it correctly. I think in the meantime, I saw in the middle of the talk, I, in the middle of the talk, I thought I understood it. So <laughs> the, the, the flux along the axis has to be has to be. Uh, 
constant, right? Because it's just co uh, conservation of the number of photons in it. Because it's right, passive, they're not disappearing. Right? It's passive. They're right? not disappearing or they're not. Right, so passive. therefore, they come back out the other end. Yeah, sure. Therefore, the, the, at any point, the flux has to has to be the same, right? Yeah. They they can't escape out of the system of boundaries uh, except at the edges. Right? Well, that's what I mean. But but you have a certain number coming in, and some of it ends up going back out when right. that flux. And, right. and so the amount coming in is different, coming in this way is different than the amount going out that way. Yes. How can the flux be, be a constant throughout there? I just, I just don't get it. So you are worried about stuff being reflected in the middle? Reflecting it by it going back, yeah. But, but, I but this is that point on, on the left side too, right? If it goes back. So I mean, so should, I, should I say or should I not say? I, I would be <laughs> happy for you to say. I'll try and continue. to do it because right, right, my it defense. on everything <laughs> basis. Uh, I'll try and see if I can stumble through this. So everything, like, so you, what you're seeing is basically something coming in, something going out, right? And But over here, it's just going out in this direction. If you want to think of one incidence where you, inside the waveguide, let's say there's a single scatter, and you have some input, and there's some reflection from that, and there's some transmission. So we're just looking at a single scatter. But if you subtract this input from that yeah. output, that's going to be the same value as what exactly. you have output yes. over yeah. here. Yeah. Right. So, so at the at the entrance, the the input is large and and the reflection is it's large. Is. As you yes. go further in, yeah. Well, I, forward is the is. Yeah. There's a very simple way, and we operate on this on this term. There's a, you can uh, split the J Z into J plus and J minus. Mm -hmm. What the constant means that the J plus the, uh, minus J minus the difference remains That's the same. same. Yes, okay. yeah. But what happens is that you start with everything going right and nothing going back, exactly. mm -hmm. and then gradually you switch over that everything that uh, reached that. Uh, you know, moves moves forward. It, by the time you reach the uh, the output uh, facet, you only have forward propagating, and nothing comes back. That's why the intensity goes down, right? And the intensity measures uh, intensity is a scalar. Oh, so it much has energy. a contribution yeah, of both. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. okay, I got it now. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else? Okay. okay. Yep, me too. Okay. All right. Uh, so should we just have a discussion uh, with the members? members? Yeah, I, I actually have to go. Uh, I have to teach at 11. That, that clock's wrong. That's yeah, we're we'll off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah it's 10.51. So, so, so leave, leave. We, we can have like two minutes, and then I'll, I'll leave, and you guys yeah. can finish it off. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I'm fine.